Good day, everyone. My name is Sheru, one of the pastors of Pinnacle Village, and we are on our sixth beatitude when Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We all want to see God. We all want to feel His presence, His nearness, and experience His blessings. But sometimes we feel that He seems far away or that he's silent as if he doesn't care about what we're going through. He seems very distant, especially when we're going through the most difficult times, um, as if the problems never disappear. They just go from one problem to another. Sometimes we feel so abandoned by God. Does he really care at all? Lord, I've been praying, I've been reading my Bible, I'm doing everything you want me to do. I go to church, I give my tithes, I attend my huddle regularly. But why does it feel like I'm cursed or uh, my? I, I still keep fighting with my spouse? My child hates me, my financial problems never go away. I'm still so unhappy in my job, my life. I feel so lost and so lonely, so alone. I'm in so much pain. Why is this all happening to me, Lord? God wants us to be happy. And He wants us to see Him, to really see Him. But perhaps He is asking us to do something first. We have to trust that every word that comes from God is His clear and unconditional love for us, for us to see Him and to experience true happiness. He says we have to be pure in heart. What does this mean? A human being can survive even if he doesn't have legs or arms or ears or eyes, but we cannot survive without a heart. The heart is the source of life, which pumps blood for the whole body. If the heart is clogged with plaques, a person can have a heart attack and die. Same thing with our spiritual life. If it is clogged with impurities like ego, pride, selfishness, disappointments, negativity, our relationship with God will die. Let's look at the biblical definition of the heart. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The heart is who you are. Everything about you, your personality, your thoughts, your emotions, your will, your desires, your passions, your decisions, your affections, everything about you. So we need to take care of it. For Jesus, he was most concerned with the condition and health of our hearts. Why? In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is the most deceitful thing there is and is desperately wicked. No one can really know how bad it is. And Jesus says in Matthew 15, 19, Out of the heart come evil thoughts and plans, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, slanders, verbal abuse, irreverent speech, blaspheming. And the world always dictates, follow your heart. But obviously we cannot do that because... The Word of God says our heart is deceitful. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. What Jesus says is, follow me. We cannot trust our hearts, friends. We can only trust God. God wants to keep our hearts pure. What do we mean by pure? According to William Barclay, the Greek word for pure is kataros. It means clean, 
like dirty soiled clothes being washed clean, or when an army is purged of all cowardly and inefficient soldiers, and it becomes a force composed solely of first-class fighting men, kataros can be used of milk or wine, which is unmixed with water, or of metal, which has no tinge of alloy or impurities. So it means God wants our hearts to be unmixed, unadulterated, and unalloyed. It means we have singleness of devotion and loyalty and faithfulness to God. No other God but Him. James 4.8 says, Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. That's why Jesus had to rebuke the Pharisees, their very religious people, because they were double-minded. He called them hypocrites. They claimed to follow God through public religious performances. They said the right words and followed the commandments to the letter. But their hearts were far from God. They were very disconnected. So Jesus said to them in Luke 16, 15, You make yourselves look good in front of people, but God knows what is really in your hearts. So Jesus is showing us that purity is going beyond external performances, beyond holy acts and rituals, going to church, giving our tithes, reading scripture, crying out to God, and experiencing no change in attitude. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the pure in action, blessed are the pure in speech. He didn't say that. He said, blessed are the pure in heart. What matters to him is what's inside of us. Let's quickly look at David, the king of Israel. When God instructed Samuel the prophet to find the next king of Israel, Samuel saw Eliab, the brother of David. But God said to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David had moral failures and imperfections. He committed adultery, murder. He was a terrible father, and yet he was known to be the man after God's own heart. Why? How? Because he had his heart fully surrendered to God. He humbled himself before God. He asked for forgiveness from God and trusted God with all his heart. So, how can we have a pure heart? First, let your hearts be searched by God, moment by moment. Our hearts are prone to wander. We are easily swayed by the things of this world. Money, relationships, temptations, problems. Pastor Gregory Brown in his book, The Beatitudes, said, our hearts are idol factories, prone to love and worship things other than God. Because of this, we must continually guard it, not only from sinful things, listen carefully po, but also good things that might steal our affections. We need to ask for God's help in searching our hearts moment by moment because we're not always aware of our selfishness. And if something or someone is already taking the place of God in our hearts, Jeremiah 17, 9, I'll read the message version po. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out, but I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. 
our hearts will always have that default to self-protect, to self-preserve, and justify our behaviors. So we need to pray Psalm 139 verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. As we do regular checkups at the doctor, we need to do regular heart checkups with God. We need to always present before God our hearts and be honest before Him. Lord, how's my public life? Is it the same with my private life? Lord, am I being true to you at home? Is it the same in church, when I'm in church? Lord, do I just give my heart to you on a Sunday and then on a Monday, it's still me who takes control over my life? If people could hear my thoughts, would they be blessed? Lord, am I guarding my heart when it comes to the things that I watch, the, the things I listen to, the things I read? Is this thing, this person helping me draw closer to you or are they pulling me away from you? Lord, how's my heart when it comes to my finances? Is money taking your place already? Or is my mind being consumed by money already? First thought when I wake up in the morning, money problems. Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve both God and money. Lord, does my heart really belong to you? Is it fully surrendered to you? Ray Pritchard, a pastor, said, To be pure in heart means that you are sincere, transparent, and without guile. What you see is what you get. No trickery, no fakery, no hypocrisy. A counselor said that he often tells his counselees, You're only as sick as your secrets. The more you have to hide, the sicker you are. And if you've got a lot of secrets... You're really sick. First John 5.21 says, Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. How can we have our hearts searched by God? Through prayer and His Holy Word. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need the word of God to change us because we cannot do it ourselves. Po. Only God and his word can change our hearts. Let's use the word of God to reveal our hearts, our innermost thoughts, our deepest secrets. Po. Do not be afraid to come clean before God. There is no greater freedom and happiness than to keep no secrets from God and from the world. Use the word of God to wash you clean. And just be honest before God because there's, there's so much freedom when, when God confronts us and the word of God mirrors who we are. Anna, you're very prayerful, but you're not treating your spouse the way I want you to treat him or her. You're not loving your spouse the way you should. You're not loving your child the way you should. You're different at home and at work. You're different when you're at home and when you're in church. Anna, you're, you love reading the Bible, but you're still very egoistic. The self is still very strong. You're still proud. You have to forgive that person. Anna, why don't you believe in me? Why don't you trust me? Let go. Let go of your past, your bitterness, all your hurts. Release everything to me and I'll take care of you. 
Anak, you love praying but you're still so worried about your finances. Leave it to me. Friends, let the word of God speak to you and change you and mold you to the person that he wants you to be. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is alive and powerful. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Friends, develop the habit of not just reading the word of God every day, but using it to reveal who you are. Let it master you. Let it consume you. Think about the word of God the whole day. Let it wash and refresh you the whole day. Let it be a spa for your soul. Develop always the habit of asking God first, seeking God first, consulting with God first before making any decision so that the purity of your heart remains. Let God be in control. Let God search your heart moment by moment. Second, be sold out to God. R.T. Kendall said in his book, The Sermon on the Mount, Purity of heart means that the person is totally sold out to God. There is no rival spirit with this person, as if he cannot decide whom to follow. His mind is made up. This person is virtually untouchable by the lure of money, sex, or power. Such a person will not likely give in to being bribed, flattered, or tempted into sinning. Friends, to be sold out to God is to be all in for Him, to go all out for Him, nothing kept for ourselves, not 1% of ourselves, more of you, Lord, less of me, none of me, so that we will just follow Him and no longer ourselves, so that we will keep fighting for our integrity, honesty, authenticity, and sincerity. Allow me to read the Amplified Version of Matthew 5, 8. Blessed, anticipating God's presence, spiritually mature, are the pure in heart, those with integrity, moral courage, and godly character, for they will see God. Friends, we still exist in the fallen world, and so we are continuously being surrounded by trials and temptations and the allures of this world, power, prestige, position, self-promotion. That's why it's hard. <laughs> it's impossible to be a Christian. And that's why God is giving us these beatitudes to protect and guard our hearts. Sadly, there are still some Christians who are not firmly and grounded and rooted in the faith. They we are still labeled as hypocrites, double-minded. We say one thing but do another thing. Our words are inconsistent with our lifestyle. We say we love God, but we don't want to forgive. We say we love God, but we're judgmental and we're still selfish. We always complain. It's also very sad that it's all over the news. Pastors have been leaving their calling because of immoral issues. And so, all the more we need to guard and protect our hearts against these things so that our integrity is not compromised. We will still make mistakes even if we don't want to. We may still lie to our spouse we may still snap at our children. We may still be consumed by anxiety, financial problems. We may do stupid things because of loneliness. And we're still tempted to make decisions out of the will of God, to have lustful thoughts, check out porn. We may still curse. But... We need to continue to fight the good fight of faith. We can only have a completely 100% pure heart when we are already with God in eternity. We are on our way there through sanctification and God is helping us. So how can we be sold out to God so that the guarding and protecting is continuous? 
as we guard and have our hearts searched by God moment by moment, we want to develop having the constant state of poverty in spirit, mourning, meekness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, mercifulness, and the habit of acknowledging and confessing our sins before God, our failures, our mistakes, and continuously asking for forgiveness from God. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we do not confess our sins and ask for forgiveness regularly, our hearts will eventually harden and we will slowly separate ourselves from God. We won't be able to see God. We won't be able to feel His nearness and we will just go down the dark, lonely path. You will be very unhappy and empty. So friends, every single time po that we do something to hurt God or other people, may it be our automatic response to come to God, no matter how difficult it is or how guilty and ashamed we feel. Just come to God, ask for His forgiveness, and He will help us. He will forgive us. Ask for strength not to do it again. Ask for help to make things right with the people that we hurt, to learn from our mistakes, to get back up again, to draw closer to Jesus and to thank Him for the gift of the cross, the gift of grace, the gift of the gospel. Because having a pure heart, friends, doesn't mean having a perfect heart. Having a pure heart, being sold out to God, means that we are more aware of our mistakes and we are more aware that I am a child of God and He loves me and nothing and no one can snatch me away from Him. Having a pure heart means, Lord, I want to love you with all my heart. Help me to love you. Teach me to love you. Guard me. It's intentionally, regularly praying, asking for God's help, asking Psalm 8611, Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. It's praying regularly, Psalm 5110, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The heart is who you are. That's why you need to offer everything you are back to God so that the self will not prevail. Thomas Watson said, he was a Puritan preacher, the heart must especially be kept pure because the heart is the main seat or place of God's residence. Therefore, it must be pure and holy. If the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then the heart is the holy of holies. Take care not to defile the room where God is to come. Let that room be washed with holy tears. The heart sanctifies all we do. If the heart is holy, all is holy. Our inclinations and our duties will be holy. The heart is the spring of all our actions. Let us keep this spring from poison. John MacArthur said, How can your heart be made pure? No, you cannot do it on your own. That's the first step. Our hearts are cleansed by faith. You cannot do it by works, but you can by believing in the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from sin. Friends, Pinnacle Village is here for you to help you be searched by God, to help you be sold out to God. Just show up for Sundays, Ethos, Anchored, a &H, Powerhouse, our huddles, 
I spoke with one mom recently and she said, I thank God for PV and everything that the church has to offer because if not, I would be so lost. And so friends, yes, purity is very unpopular today. It's easier to just follow the self, but we know that's going to be very disastrous. So what do we get by keeping our hearts pure? What is our reward for being faithful to God when others are not faithful? When they get to live the lives they want, they continue to live their selfish lives. Is keeping our hearts pure worth it? That's a big definite yes. Because we get to see God. And seeing and knowing God is our highest and greatest good. Psalm 24 verse 3 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. It's not easy preaching on a pure heart. I became a Christian when I was eight years old, Bo but I had no one to guide and disciple me. I had no huddle, so I lived a double life. I was a goody-goody, self-righteous, toot girl on the outside, but inside I was very far from God. I read the Bible, I prayed, went to church regularly, but I still lived the life that I wanted to live. I entered into wrong relationships, was very judgmental, was very egoistic until God. God's love just kept running after me. That's why I knew that I was eight years old because his hand never left me. He was always with me all those years. He never let me go. I knew that he was the one who had to break up my wrong relationships because I could not do it on my own. I did not understand it then. It was very, very painful. All the painful things I went through, I knew that he allowed them to happen or else I would not come to him. I would not draw closer to him. If it had not been for him, I would be so lost. And until today, he never lets me go. He continues to refine me and purify me and discipline me and define me. And it's very painful, like sandpaper on my skin. But I've never felt his love more than ever. I see him working in me. And I see him in my most painful moments. In, and in my happiest moments, I see him in my lowest and in my highest. That's inside out. That's why we need to offer everything we are to God, moment by moment, offering all our emotions to God, letting God take control over our emotions board. My prayer as St. Paul prayed for the Ephesians, is Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Friends, God created our hearts to have eyes. The question is, what do you see? What matters in life is not what happens to you. What matters is what you see. The reality is not what happens to you, but how you perceive what happens to you. So you can go through the worst problem ever and you still see God. It's what you carry in your heart. Oh, if all you see is pain, problems, the offense done to you, the insult, the betrayal, the hopelessness, the disappointment done to you, 
that's because that's what you are carrying in your heart. You only see who you are. You only see what you carry in your heart. That's why we want to develop the habit of God searching our hearts and making sure that it's God entering our hearts, taking, letting God take the seat, the throne in our hearts. That's why we always hear, fix your eyes on Jesus, not on the storm. You notice, you meet people who go through the worst circumstances and they can still dance and sing and smile and pray and worship and they're okay. And you have people, they have all the blessings in the world and all they can see is negative. Non-stop complaining. You have to allow God to take control over your heart so that we can truly see His sovereignty his providence, you may not see it exactly at the moment of your pain. But you know, you can trust that as you wait upon the Lord, one day, you'll just laugh at your problem and you will know, yes, that was God all along. You know, you can trust that God is just working and moving working in you, through you, for you. That's God's providence. That's Romans 8, 28, that in all things, He works together for the good of those who love Him according to His purpose. We have to trust that, friends, and so it's worth it to keep our hearts pure, to just trust Him with all our hearts, do not leave anything for yourself. Do not compromise. Do not fall into temptation. Just walk with Him moment by moment. And the promise of God, you know, this seeing of God is not a one-time thing. John MacArthur says, They shall see God. The verb is a future form in Greek, a future continuous tense. In other words, we shall be continually seeing God for ourselves. Do you know what happens when your heart is purified at salvation? You live in the presence of God. You comprehend Him. You realize that He is there. You see Him with a spiritual eye. Purity of heart cleanses the eyes of the soul so that God is visible. We can never be in God's kingdom, never enter God's presence, never have His forgiveness, never know the Redeemer, never know salvation, and die frustrated in our sins unless our hearts are pure. The wonder of it is that this is exactly what Jesus Christ has come to do, to purify our hearts. When He died on the cross, He took the sin that was accounted to us and paid all the penalty. The Bible says he then imputed his righteousness to us. It's a fantastic exchange. He takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ and God looks at us, he sees us pure. Under no other condition does he see us that way. By faith, God makes us pure. Friends, when our hearts are pure, we see God in everything, in everyone, everywhere. We see God in painful circumstances, in the worst storms of our lives, in sickness and in death. They become blessings in disguise. The way Job saw God in his worst circumstance, in his problematic friends. The way Joseph saw God in the betrayal of his brothers while he was in prison. Why? Because the Lord was with Joseph. The way the Lord is with us today. He is with you. He is right beside you, in you, loving you. We see God in people, in even in testy, difficult people, because they just make us want to cling to God more and pray more. We see God in His Word, in church, everywhere. And so, you know, 
sometimes when you meet a person and you say, he's such a pure heart. She's such a pure heart and we wish that's how people would describe us too. But let me end po with one such pure heart with this profile of Miss Fanny Crosby, the queen of gospel songwriters. Miss Fanny wrote more than 8,000 hymns. The most remarkable thing about her was that she had done so in spite of her blindness. These sources are from Christian Biographies and ChristianityToday.com. Although she wrote multiple books and songs, Miss Fanny prayed her hymns would change lives. Planning to witness to one million men and women through her music, Fanny recorded the names of those who shared they had confessed faith in Jesus. She was born in New York, and she had been able to see only for the first six weeks of her life until she got sick within two months. Unfortunately, the family doctor was away, and another man, pretending to be a certified doctor, treated her by prescribing hot mustard poultices to be applied to her eyes. Her illness was healed, but the treatment left her blind. One preacher told her, I think it's a great pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts upon you. Fanny Crosby responded at once, Do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind? Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. Her love of poetry began when she was eight years old and it echoed her lifelong refusal to feel sorry for herself. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. While she enjoyed her poetry, she zealously memorized the Bible. She said it was Grandma who brought the Bible to me and me to the Bible. And this is how we know that Miss Fanny was a child of joy because she allowed the Word of God to guard her heart. She said, I feel a hundred hymns in my head. The Lord has given me a purpose in my life. Incredibly, Miss Fanny composed six or seven hymns a day. Among them is our favorite blessed assurance. And to God be the glory and Jesus keep me near the cross. Miss Fanny has tasted and seen that the Lord is good and desires others to enjoy the same bountiful feast. Shut in from the distracting sights of the outer world, she has seen deeply into eternal truth and has put that truth into verse that has influenced countless thousands of lives. During the last years of her life, Miss Frances Ridley Havergal, another hymn writer, kept up a correspondence with Fanny Crosby, though they never met. And Miss Frances wrote these lines in admiration of Miss Fanny for her spiritual insight, her resignation, and her consecration. How can she sing in the dark like this? What is her fountain of light and bliss? Her heart can see, her heart can see. Well, may she sing so joyously. For the king himself, in his tender grace, has shown her the brightness of his face. And to speak of the purity of Miss Fanny's heart, she said, I have not for a moment in more than 85 years felt a spark of resentment against the doctor because I have always believed that the good Lord consecrated me to the work that I am still permitted to do. God will answer your prayers, she said, better than you think. Of course, one will not always get exactly what he has asked for. We all have sorrows and disappointments, but one must never forget that if commended to God, they will issue in good his own solution, is far better than any we could conceive. It seemed intended by the blessed 
providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank Him for the dispensation. Blindness cannot keep the sunlight of hope from the trustful soul. One of the easiest resolves that I formed in my young and joyous heart was to leave all care to yesterday and to believe that the morning would bring forth its own peculiar joy. Friends, to see God is our greatest good. Jeremiah 29.13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Someday, we will see God with our very own eyes in heaven, friends. No more impurities, no more pain, no more suffering. What a glorious time that would be. And Gregory Brown reminds us to grow in purity of heart. We must continually think on eternity. But while we are still here on earth, God is already allowing us to experience heaven, to see Him, to really see Him and experience Him, His goodness, His peace, His love. We just need that discipline, the habit of having our hearts searched by Him moment by moment, having our hearts close to Him and to be sold out to Him to be so loyal and faithful to Him, keeping nothing for ourselves. He is with us, friends. Let's respond with this beautiful old song. Make it a prayer that our hearts may be pure before Him. Yeah. 
Let's end with prayer po. Purify our hearts, O Lord. Cleanse us. Wash us. Refresh us. For we want to see you. We want to experience you moment by moment. We ask for your forgiveness, O Lord, for the times that we hurt you. And we ask for your strength to do better, to draw closer to you, to trust you, to love you more. We pray, O Lord, that we will not keep anything for ourselves, that we will always be fully surrendered to you, that you will take your throne in our hearts, you will take control over our emotions, our decisions, our actions, that we will be in the habit of always asking you first, consulting with you first, before doing anything. Purify us, O Lord, of anything that is taking your place. Thank you, Father, for the hope of seeing you, of experiencing your love and your peace. Thank you for the strength that you give us every day. We just want to love you with all of our hearts. We also thank you, Father, for the privilege to be able to give our tithes and love offerings. Lord, we want to do this with pure hearts because we love you. Thank you for the privilege of sacrifice and for all of your blessings for us. We entrust everything to you, O Lord, and I pray that every person listening right now will be enlightened in their hearts. Salamat po, Dios. We entrust this whole week to you. I pray that you will shower upon each one your grace, your love, your peace, your strength, your wisdom, and your nearness. No greater good than to be near you and to experience the freedom of being honest and open before you. We love you so much, Lord. Be glorified. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Pinnacle Village. God bless your week, Pop.